Good morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO. In this year of unprecedented uncertainty for small nonprofits just like ours, you can make a direct impact on the future of our organization. As a nonpartisan organization, our mission is to foster civic engagement and build programs that bring people together from around the world around the most compelling issues. This diversity of views presented by experts and leaders in their fields is needed today more than ever. With your generous support, we will be able to continue to serve you and our global community. Thank you so much for supporting us. It's now my great pleasure to introduce today's program, Preserving Mental Health During a Pandemic, with Dr. Jay Finkelman, industrial and forensic psychologist. He is a business and psychologist professor and department chair of IO. Dr. Nadia Jones, a marriage and family therapy educational psychologist and associate professor at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology's LA campus. Our moderator is Dr. Bina Parekh, Associate Department Chair and Associate Professor with the Clinical Psychology Program at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. For those of you who would like to ask questions of our distinguished panel, there's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzik, our Vice President of Events, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion of the program, which will start in about 25 minutes. You can type your questions in at any time. Dr. Parekh, it's time for me to turn this program over to you and our distinguished panelists. Thank you so much for joining us all today. Thank you so much for, for allowing us to come. Uh, we're very, very excited to be here. Today we have uh, two esteemed colleagues of mine, uh, Dr. Jones and Dr. Finkelman. Um, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate this opportunity to hear your views and perspectives as psychologists. Uh, Dr. Jones, as, as was stated before, is a family and marriage therapist and educational psychologist. Dr. Finkelman is an industrial forensic psychologist specializing in human resource management. And I am a, a clinical health psychologist working in the healthcare industry. So um, again, thank you all for being here. So as you know, this is a really important topic that we're going to dive into today. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is we're in the midst of the holiday season and the new year is upon us. We are all approaching the one year milestone of the pandemic in the United States. Across the nation, states, counties, and even cities are juggling to balance keeping Americans safe and healthy while keeping their economies open and operating. Understandably, Americans are frustrated worried and angry. Negativity can have significant toxic effects. So I'm asking this question to both of you, Dr. Finkelman and Dr. Jones. Can each of you share from your area of specialty some productive and constructive tips and strategies for preserving one's mental health during these challenging times? Yes, of course. I will talk about the family perspective, first of all, as being um, I'm a mother of two myself with a full time job. And, you know, as you said, that we're, we're getting there to the one year of this pandemic. Um, one of the things that um, I think help families the most is just trying to be grateful, starting in that basic model of gratefulness and working from there, because when you think about it, you know, we're not in this one all alone. Like we have it, the whole world is going around it with us. And we are very lucky to be where we're at and having all of these resources compared to other parts of the world. So starting on wherever you are at, like trying to think about what's a good thing that will work for you and your family at that point, and then taking it from there forward. Uh, speaking as a mental health clinician, I think, you know, just the fact of reaching out, looking for support, checking on support groups in your community or through your kids' school, uh, checking in with a mental health counselor or professional if you're able. Many of us are doing work pro bono nowadays just to try to help the communities afloat. There's so many resources that we are gonna share with you guys at the end as well, so that you can continue to go um, into this with everybody else. But one of the things uh, specifically for families, I think is very important to keep open communication, especially with your children. Um, I think that, you know, sadly as always, the work relies on the parents. So 
parents to keep each other in check. Like if you have a partner around your house or a very close family member that you can trust on or a best friend, someone that can help you check in, you know, weekly to see how you're doing, how are you doing, how are you doing, how do they perceive you, so that you can go with that perspective towards your children to help them deal with this day by day. I think let's start there. Great, thank you, Dr. Jones. Dr. Finkelman. Reinforcing the comments that uh, Dr. Jones made, uh, clearly something that allows people to be in contact with others and in contact, not only family members, but for people who are fortunate enough to be employed in this environment, uh, the organization plays a critical role, I believe, in their mental health. Obviously, that's my background, industrial organizational psychology. So I'm, I'm biased towards looking to see what it is that organizations can do to facilitate what people are going through. And it seems that being supportive and communicative and letting people know that both that there is an end uh, to this pandemic and a part of it is uh, vaccine related, but part of it is organizations planning for the future and kind of getting people excited and engaged in terms of what is next, I think is critical for mental health of, of workers uh, just to understand that both others are going through this with you and planning ahead. And planning ahead to the holidays is a nice short-term respite, admittedly, uh, but for those who are scared at the moment, which includes a lot of people, and especially for those who may not have secure jobs, it becomes more troublesome to figure out what do we do about this. But we know that engaging people, the notion of you're not alone, that there are others out there with you. And if you are either a family or an organization, and a family is a kind of organization, increasing the level of communication, I think, is just critical. At our own university, at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology, we are getting, we as both faculty, staff, and students, are getting weekly updates from uh, our national president, uh, Dr. Nealon, as well as our deans. And, and I think that's a model that all organizations should follow increasing the frequency of communication and therefore the reassurance that there is some level of normality out there and uh, it's a group effort and we're going to prevail. Yeah, you know, if I can echo on that one, it's, it's interesting even the language, you know, like between family and industry organization because the communication is key. And uh, as you pointed out, the holidays coming in I think it's so important not just to keep the communication open, but also to be less judgmental to the family members and be more empathic of trying to understand the specific circumstances that that family is dealing with. Many families, depending on the culture you're from, we get together for the holidays. It's a whole thing, like for Christmas, like for us, like in that in culture, you wait until midnight on the 24th with your family members. And now that has changed, right? So I think in you know, if people start playing the guilty game, that also disrupt the family, uh, peace and quiet, and like the levels of mental health that you're gonna have for the holidays. If we can try to be understanding of each and a specific family that we have within our own cultural realm, that will help as well, so that we don't, you know, force them to do something that they might not feel comfortable doing, or like maybe, but oh, but I miss you, or look, that that doesn't help. So if people start saying, hey, you know, like, what's your situation right now? Like, are you taking care of someone that can be at risk? Then we totally understand. Are there any other ways to get together with you right now safely, according to what you believe in? I think it's also highly important. And this is very similar to the advice to organizations that uh, Dr. Jones just described. Organizations also have to be more flexible and more understanding. And, and recognize that people are under an extraordinary level of stress, which is creating anxiety out there. And we know that it's at the point for many individuals that it's not at all constructive. An organization has to be able to calm people down and also understand that the, the 
rigidity of prior rules and regulations never worked, but certainly aren't working now. And, and we're seeing some of that in terms of how you enforce mass compliance and things of that nature. And organizations are, are faced with similar challenges a, across many domains. So, you know, I think that what Dr. Jones and Dr. Finkelman said is really quite quite pointed and, and really kind of resonates. You know, when you look at the CDC percentages, 41% of individuals are reporting mental health concerns in this country. 11% um, are reporting suicidal ideation within the past 30 days. So we know that this is a significant issue in terms of people's daily progression. And the one thing that I would say, just as a health psychologist, is a strategy that I think really works is getting back to the basics. Mm -hmm. I think when days meld into other days and we, when you're in lockdown, you don't even know what day or time of day it is, but having routines that are set up for you and for your family in terms of when you eat together, when, when you go to bed, kind of having rituals. Rituals can be very stabilizing when there is so much uncertainty. Um, and I, I also think just having regular patterns, sleeping, eating, um, having that moments of gratitude, like Dr. Jones was talking about, having a gratitude journal, and also not only having understanding for others, but having self-compassion for self. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times we can become very self-critical in these uncertain times about our performance, about our family, about how we are doing and how we are functioning. And I think that's really important um, in terms of kind of grounding us and centering us so we can move forward. So I think that Dr. Jones and Dr. Finkelman bring up some outstanding points. Dr. Jones, I have a question for you, if yeah. I may. <laughs> the pandemic affects everyone differently and household socioeconomic demographics can be very great, very greatly impacted, ranging from single person households to multi-generational families under one roof. What behaviors should parents or adult caregivers or persons in one's pod be mindful of or concerned if there are young children at home, teenagers, college students, seniors, for example, any of those areas that you'd like to respond to? Oh, yeah. And I can go on this one forever. I'll try to keep it very short. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Um, within our, our, our immediate uh, uh, household, we have very different uh, demographics. And I thought about that question a lot, long and hard the whole week in preparation for I think, honestly, the ones that are having, believe it or not, in my personal and professional opinion, the easiest times are the little kids, because the little kids still can find so many ways to entertain themselves and play around. You can still take them to the park. They'll still be okay as long as you're stable. They'll be stable. Like, it's, it's much easier, I think, to get the younger kids to the park and, like, organize some safe uh, uh, play dates still for them outside. Uh, I am a little more concerned about the teenagers and the elders right now and college students. I mean, I was checking the stats on the elders. One out of four right now are reporting mental health issues, specifically with anxiety and depression and isolation. And that's very, very worrisome to me as they are the ones that are more at risk. And I always wonder, you know, how many people is actually checking in with them so that they, 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 those things can decrease. So I'm really worried about that. Like if you have elder people in your house, make sure that they get some, um, Oxygen, I'll take them out if you can safely. You know, that I think is very big for that part of the community. And um, the pain of the families when they have people right now at the hospital is huge. And that's when the guilt comes in as well. But also the pain of the people that are in retirement homes where they're not able to see them. So I'm really worried about that population. So it's like just try to find ways, creative ways to stay in touch with them. I think it's incredibly important. The teenagers, my teenagers concern me a lot. Um, I find that, as, as you were pointing out so wonderfully, that keeping the rituals, I think, is very important to keep, like, at least a family dinner structure, especially if you have children in your house, so that you can check on them consistently. Mm -hmm. I think we have the teenagers that either are under eating and having health issues, or they're overeating. They are not exercising as much anymore because they're not going out. Sports are canceled again. They, we go back and forth, right? And I think that the communication with them to help see how they're doing, they miss their social interactions with their friends. They're missing graduation. They're missing so many vital um, 
you know, expectation, those so many vital situations in society that impact their emotional and social development. That to me is huge. Stages of development that have been completely disrupted for them. And then my college students, you know, people that are about to graduate and they don't know if they're going to be able to get a job. There is so many um, incidents of suicidal uh, ideation right now between the teens and the college students for multiple reasons, but it's all developmentally related. So I will be concerned about that. Check in with your college students. If they are on campus, if they're staying safe, if they're at home, how are they perceiving the world? And how can we help them connect with someone? I mean, the universities and the colleges, they all have a whole bunch of resource centers, but I think sometimes the teens and the um, college students are either so worried or so involved into what's happening right now that they are forgetting how to reach out. So sometimes parents, friends, we can help them reach out. We can help them giving them gentle reminders and, uh, you know, checking alcohol consumption as well, I think is a big one right now. Absolutely, Dr. Jones. And, you know, I would dovetail with that and just say that I think it's really important also as parents to, to monitor social media use because oh, yes. there are a lot of negative influences on social media, especially now. Um, and, and young, developmentally, they don't have the cognitive ability to necessarily make appropriate decisions about what is actually being posted, how that impacts them. And so I, I was gonna ask a follow-up question about that, Dr. Jones. What are your thoughts on social media and teenagers and youth and college students, et cetera? Yeah, actually, social media was one of the big things. I was so against social media from the beginning, um, very much so. And right now we had to play the system a little bit because the kids have to engage in some social media to be in school, right? So they're doing it all through the computer, through their iPads, through their phones. However, I mean, many parents I hear now are relying a lot on video games so that their kids can have some kind of connection with their friends and their classmates. But I think that really needs to be very much monitored, especially again on teenagers. So I'm, my main area of concern with social media is the smaller kids. I mean, social media gives you a lot of instant gratification and that brain is not fully developed. So when you increase that extreme motivation for your brain, then then it's like nothing is going to make you feel better after that. So you need more and more and more and more of it to be motivated and excited about something. So when the little kids start getting so dependent on the social media to do anything, that's a sign for the parents like, no, you really do need to take that phone away. And teenagers, it's a little bit harder to take things away from them. I have parents that tell me, but what do you want me to do? They're there the whole time. I'm like, I'll take it away. Just simply take it away. You know, you have that control of like the phone. Like, you can just stop their internet like right there. There are ways where we can do it healthily and safely for them so that they are not engaging to all of that. You know, TikTok is not a super political issue. So many things that I don't even know. Like I keep learning day by day like, on all the things that they're posting. But if you open a TikTok account that the little kids get access to it from the teenagers, they're it's too much for them. And, and as you mentioned, there is so much negativity. And now they're like still relying so much on their pictures and their self-esteem being like a portrait in ways where, you know, they're just not true relationships. So I'm worried about that part, you know, like the, the impact of social media in the engagements of true relationships. But in, in fairness, there are elements of social media which if parents properly regulate can be very constructive and useful at this point in time to deal with feelings of isolation. Unfortunately, exactly as Dr. Jones described, there are all of these destructive forces part of social media, but to, you, you would not want to exclude it entirely and that wouldn't work anyway, but it, it's just a function of channeling what is good and, and what is safe for children. Yeah, like we're having these things to social media. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And and I think Dr. Jones' point about developmentally what is appropriate right. and understanding that yeah. there are so many issues that are happening that are getting what obstructed developmentally because of social media and identity formation really is 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 really kind of being impacted significantly for a lot of our children, teenagers and college students. So thank you very much for that insight. Dr. Finkelman, I have some questions for you. Um, <laughs> please talk to us about the impact the work from home order has had on Americans and their ability to pivot to a virtual work environment filled with Zoom meetings. What shifts or pivots can you recommend to either employers or employees so they can thrive in the new work or world order? Uh, 
that's a great overview question. And the reality is that uh, it, it is a very significant change. And for some of us who are used to dealing with uh, the internet and dealing with things that are not necessarily in person, it's an easy transition. So at a university level, if many of us have taught courses and part of which may be online or blended, um, no big deal. But the, the typical worker out there does not have that exposure or comfort uh, with dealing with the, with the internet and virtual work is challenging for many. So initially the reaction is, well, great. Uh, I don't have to, I, I don't have to travel. I don't have to deal with a commute. I can be comfortable. I can be with my family and pets. But then there are both distractions that are real. And this is more problematic as you go down the socioeconomic scale where there is the inability to find a private place in which to be doing some of the things that we know are critical and to do preparation. And that requires a higher level of understanding by employers that they do have to be more forgiving, more understanding. But the key goes beyond just that. The key is to make sure that people have the resources, the tools, that are necessary to be virtual and not simply assume that everyone's got to be familiar with, with Zoom or, or go to meeting because everyone is not. And it's important to make sure both from a computer point of view and uh, from a Wi-Fi point of view that if you're expecting people to be productive in a home environment, you got to give them the tools and, and the, the teaching, the training at the Chicago School, we offer training constantly because even faculty who have levels of familiarity with being online still need training in terms of the idiosyncrasies of, of Zoom or GoToMeeting or any of the other uh, platforms that are being used. So it's really a combination of being both supportive and to making sure that the tools are available for them under those circumstances, people can deal with a virtual environment uh, quite well, uh, especially if there's a time frame to it. So if they know it's not going to be endless, but there are capabilities that allow you to emulate what would be available if you were actually coming to the office with the added advantages of being able to grab snacks and things that you want and and um, it just, it, it's a more comfortable environment for many once they become familiar with it and less afraid of making mistakes. So last point, from an organizational point of view, having IT support, making sure that people recognize that they will get support if there's a failure of some kind and they're not on their own to solve every computer issue that increases the level of confidence and therefore uh, uh, self-confidence uh, and the competence that people feel towards doing their job virtually. Thank you, Dr. Finkelman. Sure. Now I have a question for you both. The pandemic's disruptive qualities have made it difficult, perhaps impossible, to celebrate or commemorate important life events like the birth of a child, a graduation, a marriage, possibly a job promotion, um, and rituals surrounding sickness and, and death, whether COVID related or not. What advice or recommendations could you offer for filling this void? Any developmental strategies for teens and children would be also appreciated. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about graduations, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've seen like since last year when we started uh, uh, dealing with this, you know, like all the schools started doing like the drive-through graduations, the people is getting creative. <laughs> And I think that that increases hope on things. I, th I think, again, like if we go from a moment of like, let's don't blame each other and let's try to figure out our levels of comfort first. I think everyone is different. If you're comfortable doing something outside, you know, when, well, when we're not in lockdown and we're allowed, uh, like right now, I think that's the main thing, like the families that are going to not respect the lockdown versus the families that are, or the families that are not going to respect the stay at home and the families that are 
I don't blame them either way. I try to understand where they're coming from and how tired and frustrated people are in general. So I go between what's safe for your family first and your beliefs and trying to respect that. Um, we still get together with uh, our immediate family um, and, you know, in a very safe way. It's the same stable pot that we had from the beginning, but we don't see anybody else. So, and we have to protect our elders. So that's my family. So asking the others the same question, I think will help to celebrate things. You can drive through with your car. You can still have a Zoom holiday. It's not the same, of course, it's not the same, but I think that's where the reframing comes, right? Right. That's where your positive thinking has to come along and say like, I still want to see you. So what can we do? So can I drive outside your house and say hi, you know, real quick, or like, can we do this? And is this good enough for our family? So I think trying to check on that first, um, based again on how we are feeling as a family, that will help a lot. Creating our new rituals, right? I think yes. people have to create new rituals yes. and become very creative. I love that. That's great. I think a key on this is to not skip any of these momentous occasions or holidays in any way because of the pandemic. That's not what we need to do or and certainly not what we want to do. So exactly as Dr. Jones described, I would celebrate them anyway in a safe mode and whether it's the, uh, the drive by wave, but you can also have happy hours and, and um, I'm doing it routinely with friends all over the country who frankly, I would not be able to do it with in person, the logistics become awkward and you can still celebrate great occasions and simply be creative all of these innovative ways to do things uh, individually, but still tie back to a group uh, are very, very satisfying. Uh, we, we are doing coffee and tea hours at the university, but there are many similar things that can be done at, at home. The key though is to keep doing them. And as you have both pointed out, as my colleagues have both pointed out, you wanna have a routine. You don't wanna have that drop out holidays, promotions, any of these celebrations are a critical part of a, a feeling of normalcy and exactly what we should be doing even more of during a pandemic environment. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Jones and Dr. Finkelman highlight this idea of normalcy and creating normalcy in uh, abnormal times. And I think that that's really, yes. you know, the pinnacle um, in terms of some of my clients, one of the things that we've been working on is just doing simple things like like writing cards, mm -hmm. um, a handwritten note. I know we're a very technological world. We email, we type things, but a handwritten note, putting it in the mail, um, sending it to a friend, sending it to a loved one can make um, all the difference just in terms of that connection because it's something tangible that you can hold on to. Um, so just you know, like Dr. Jones and Dr. Finkelman are saying, being creative, right? Being creative and figuring out different ways to do that. So thank you both for your insights on that. Um, I have another question for both of you. <laughs> what does resiliency look like in the family or household? What does a state of thriving look like specifically in the work environment? The work environment, I'll see the family. <laughs> So it's like, to me, like, thriving is this, right? It's, I, I'm a relational therapist. So to me, it's all about relationships. What drive me are relationships. These kinds of situations, personally and professionally, for me are huge, but also engaging my children in the same circumstances. I still help them give up, give uh, back in the community. We still go, we still go check the homeless because they're there, you know, they need it too. So we go, we say hi, we give them something. And it's just like trying to, you know, you want to build resiliency, then you have to go and do something about it. Um, get out of your your head, like literally, because the that's where the isolation starts in your head, right? So it's like we were like, okay, let's go, let's go to the park, let's go on the on the bike, let's go right out, let's force yourself. I'm forcing myself to exercise as well, because we we're falling into all these different patterns, right? And if we have to keep a structure and keep uh, uh, engaged and motivated, then we have to start and leading with the example, right? So we do it. And I encourage my students to do it as well. I'm like, what did you do? What are you going to do this week? And then I check in with them. So I think that really helps out in that area. And and once again, the, the parallel to what organizations should be doing is, is obvious. Resiliency is a key quality of healthy individuals, and it's a key quality of healthy organizations. So recognizing that things have changed 
and, and not continually fighting the change, but rather taking advantage perhaps of opportunities that the change creates, even a bad thing as in the pandemic, and, and just watching what companies are doing and the changes in the way smart companies have responded. So you could have gone on, uh, Lyft and Uber, for example, could have said, well, we're, we're out of business, people just aren't using it as much but they have shifted into ancillary businesses, whether it's food delivery and related activities, and great organizations have to be facile and they have to be resilient uh, in order to survive. And individuals need to be resilient for their own mental health and recognize that nothing stays constant. We're in a more rapidly changing environment now than what most of us are used to, and therefore the need for resiliency faster is, is even greater. But we don't set the timing of, of things. These are some events that are outside of our control. We just have to be clever and creative in responding to them in a healthy fashion, either from a family point of view or an organizational point of view. Absolutely. You know, I was thinking about this topic of resiliency and it's a really kind of an interesting one because I think that in times of multiple stressors, some of us have a harder time being resilient because we have so much on our plate and we're managing so much. And resiliency for a lot of us is not, I think there's a misnomer around resiliency in the sense that there are things that are going to make you feel sad. There mm -hmm. are going to make things that make you feel anxious. There are going to make things that make you feel angry and frustrated. And part of it is being able to understand that and being mindful that that is happening for you. And because that creates, that moment of integration creates the resiliency. It's resiliency is not meaning that, hey, I don't, I don't feel these things and I don't acknowledge them. It's really about this process of true acknowledgement and you know, a lot of people say, well, I just have to move past these things. You don't have to move past anything. You have to move forward, which is different. Right. Past means that you're not actually what? Actually th integrating it and thriving. And like Dr. Jones said, really kind of accepting what is happening at, in the moment. But we, we don't want to move past. We want to move forward. And if we move forward, Dr. Finkelman's talking about this idea of creativity. That's where creativity is kind of nurtured. When we move forward, we can see things in different ways, right? And we can be more in the moment and more present focused. So I really loved how both of you captured that essence. Yeah, I love what you just said. I have to echo on that because it was, it was beautifully put together. That's one. And I, I remember we did a whole program for anxiety for uh, high school students, middle schoolers and, and, and high school level. And um, what we were pointing out at them since the pandemic started, is like anxiety is not a bad thing. Like people keep saying, you know, like, don't feel this. It's like, it's not about stopping the feeling. It's about acknowledging the feeling and figure out what to do about it. And anxiety is normal. Like people will have anxiety right now, that will be a little off right like that would be an indicator of what but it's okay to get sad it's okay to get anxious about it. it's okay to be scared you know it's but just like finding a way to to acknowledge them to accept them to recognize it and to figure out who you can talk about it you know not just like repressing it and taking it in so that you can move forward that was beautiful great so i'm gonna ask the final question for our last question before we open the discussion to the audience's questions what gives you hope that people can experience a state of thriving and resiliency? I Either one of you can answer that. <laughs> people very... always... so, go ahead, Dr. Finkel. You... Thank you, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, people always have, and uh, the world has not come to an end during past crises. We have a rich history, literally thousands of years, uh, in which we deal with things that were totally unexpected. We rise to the occasion as a people, as a nation, as a world, and, and we overcome it. So you, you have to be a bit of a student of history. And as many have said, you, you have to read a little bit and kind of recognize that this pandemic is not the first pandemic and that these are not, and we are not the only people to have experienced this, 
but we always do get through it. And it, it's a function of what is a healthy response to it. And, and I think this is the opportunity to do the right things under these circumstances, recognize that there is light um, at the end of the tunnel, and that light is not a train coming at us, that we, we will survive this. And there are things that we should be doing and thinking about right now that are both preparing us for future opportunities and also taking advantage of current opportunities. So we, we can't always be living in the future. We certainly don't want to be living in the past. We just have to look to see where we are now. How do we optimize that situation? Dr. Jones. <laughs> Thank you. That was awesome. <laughs> How did I follow that one? Um, we, you know, we, we're humans. I think we have to remember that we're humans. Humans make mistakes, but they also have that ability of move forward. And you, with the right connections and the right relationships, you can, again, increase your creativity and your positive thinking towards that future that you're going to be going through. But with a lot, it, it, it depends on your attitude. I, I am very hopeful because I see I see the little kids, right? I, I I actually specialize on little children. And when you were talking, when we were talking in the beginning about the kids that start kinder in the pandemic, you know, that's their normal. And like we keep talking about normal, 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 but we we as humans have this amazing ability to adjust, to adjust to whatever is thrown at us. It's just sometimes we forget that we can do that. So you just adjust, like you have to deal with the things that are presented to you. Like you can fight this one, it's a virus. So that you have to adjust to the virus. So when little kids can have that kind of attitude and you see them in them and how resilient they are, grownups can learn so much from that. You know, grownups get stuck into their heads again. And the little kids, yeah, like, if you're the mom, go like, hey, when I go see your friends outside, put on a mask eight, eight feet apart, not even six. Anything. This is how much eight feet is, let's go do it. And they just go, and for them, that's what they're gonna do because they wanna go out. They are not like, oh my God, I have to put on this, I have to leave. They can just go. So I am very hopeful because I think that as all of these discussions keep happening and people are starting to read more and getting informed more because it's still going. So I think we will continue to adjust so that we can as a nation move forward. As a world, we can move forward. This is happening everywhere. So and that's the wonderful thing. I mean, look at the three of us. We're from different backgrounds. And if we go and talk people in our, like I am Argentinian Peruvian, when I go talk to them, I check on them. How are they doing? How is it going over there? How is it going over here? Like we also do the virtual happy hour because we're far apart. And you see, you know, they're all in the same mindset. So just remembering all of those things and that we can move forward together as, you know, I don't think it's so unrealistic. Absolutely. You know, I was thinking about, um, both of what Dr. Finkelman and Dr. Jones said in terms of moving forward and historical understanding. And when you look at SARS and you look at MERS, the mortality rates for Hong Kong and, and Taiwan were between 17 and 21 percent. And what was very evident is that we are all in a moment of collective trauma, which means an entire society is going through a traumatic event together. And when Asia went through SARS and MERS, they were experiencing a significant collective trauma. But when you actually look at the empirical studies that have looked at those nations and those communities, they've actually become tighter. They actually have more social connection. They have more appreciation for each other, um, especially for frontline workers. And what's really happened is the fabric of the community was actually in some ways reinforced. So when the, the COVID-19 pandemic hit, they already had a psychological infrastructure that allowed them to work together to beat these challenges. And I feel very certain that we can also be able to work in the same way if we look at that as a model. So I always keep that in my, my mind as an example of, of what people can do when they develop a certain sense of community through tragedy. And organizations function the same way. Organizations that have been through crises do become stronger and they develop coping mechanisms in much the same way that people and countries do as well so that it isn't as difficult the next time around so the recovery is faster and so the damage is lessened absolutely yeah. the same thing with families families are coping together families are more together now i think that they have been before uh, the parents that, that were now working from home, yes, it increases your challenges, but also increases the time that you're spending with your family. 
and they see you working. You know, you're, it's a good example for your children. So I, I Jessica, I'm not sure if there's any questions for from the audience, but we'd all be open to answering any questions. Perfect. Thank you so much. We do have a lot of questions coming in, so um, we'll try to get right to uh, as many of them as we can. Uh, several questions coming in about any tips for an older person living alone if, or with no family close by. Yeah, you know, we did at the university a pen pal program as well. Uh, the, I know that there are organizations that are doing them all through nationwide. It was a huge hit on Facebook. Um, I think that the challenge is to figure out like how cognitively, where are they at? Um, if you have uh, uh, family members that are elder and they're in a retirement home, call the retirement home, ask their procedures because there are a way that you can communicate with them. Some retirement homes will be willing to let you be outside and have like a, a kind of like communication with them through windows and they can see you and they have schedules for it. Others, when the people are not necessarily able to move towards the window, they will put some uh, links for them in there. I think it's all about how creative can you get to where they are at? Now, we also do have family members. Um, uh, my mom has a dear friend in Indiana who lives by herself. She's 94 and now she's hard of hearing. And, you know, there is a community network that was created through her church in this case, they're religious. So if you actually help them figure out how they can get together with someone else so that people can be checking on them so they're not as isolated, so they're not being left alone, so their families can feel a little bit closer, then that will help, especially around the holidays. And, and we probably all have an obligation to reach out to people like that who we know so they're not left alone. I, I think that's a basic moral responsibility that we share as society. Yeah, when I was when I was talking to a lot of the um, retirement homes for the PEMPA program that we created, they told me that there are elders that haven't heard from anybody in months. So that's what we went through with complete strangers, just sending them those handwritten letters. Right. It's because that gives you a sense of self again. And like, oh, I can communicate with someone. Some people are completely left alone. So yes, I love that the moral responsibility to them. I think one thing I've found too is that there is a generational difference that younger people like to text and mm -hmm. older people actually really appreciate a phone call. So if you're trying to connect with your community, sometimes you have to think about how they want to be communicated with. Nice. And so as much as texting my dad all the time to check in with him, he loves a phone call more than a barrage of daily texts. <laughs> yeah. um, Dr. Finkelman, how would you advise employers to treat the different perspectives of employees, those that are ready to get back to work for economic reasons and those who don't want to return to work over virus fears? That's going to be a challenge a lot of companies will face going forward. Uh, you're, you're absolutely correct, Jessica. It's a challenge that is being faced now. Smart companies have read the research. Employees can be very productive working at home. And many companies, we know that a certain percentage, and this is still debatable, of organizations are going to permit remote work for a certain percentage of their workforce, and in the case of some companies, for all of their workforce. We also know the research that indicates that productivity is not necessarily reduced by working remotely, and in many instances is actually improved. So just think about the save time. You don't have to allow for commute times. There are many things that are saved by working remotely. So organizations that are in a position to permit work from home should do that. They have to be flexible as well as resilient that we've all been talking about. And they have to permit it for positions in which it's possible to perform the essential functions of those jobs from a, a home environment and encourage people to never have to do something that makes them frightened or uncomfortable because that just creates hostile employees and you begin to get uh, passive aggressive forms of behavior, which my colleagues are more of an expert on than I am, but uh, it's dysfunctional behavior that can be overcome by showing some sensitivity to people who say, well, I'd, I'd really, I'm not comfortable coming in. I would love to work from a home somewhere that it's safe. I would try to let them do it. If you can do it, and you are not hurting others by doing it, 
You just have to be aware that it creates equity issues, and that's the biggest challenge. So you, you want to be able to assure people that they all have this opportunity if they're feeling uncomfortable coming to work. But regardless, you are obligated not to put people in a circumstance in which they're anxious or afraid. Thank you so much. And Dr. Jones, this is a little bit of a, a follow up to that. I mean, this pandemic has obviously really divided people um, and how they approach the virus, whether they're concerned, whether they like a mask, whether they want a mask. And we've gotten a lot of questions on that. So how would you advise that people talk about COVID-19 with friends or loved ones who are really fearful and anxious about the virus or angry at others for handling the virus differently to acknowledge yeah. the risk, but also not harm their mental health? Yeah, I think, um, you know, between family members, uh, it, it happens a lot. It has happened to my clients, it happened within my own family, you know, that we have different views. We have some family members in one area of, um, you know, so-called that they don't they don't follow the same precautions that we follow but because we have elderly um in-laws then we can get us together with them as as we do however i think again the main thing is communication and asking them what are they comfortable with i don't resent them for it that's their way of thinking and it's more like about like when we wanted to get together for the holidays i asked them you know are you willing to get tested so it's like if you're willing to get tested and would you give me a word that for a couple of days you won't see anybody or you will be responsible, then we can get together in a safe distance. And if they're like, no, it's not my thing, like it happened to other, with other uh, relationships that we have, then I go like, okay, no worries, then we can just see the drive-through and, and that's it. And I think the main thing is like the anger that's been happening with people all around the world. I was, oh, actually, I was having another discussion yesterday with a, 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 a colleague in Belgium and they're very engaged against children under 12 wearing masks. And I go, well, here is mandatory. So I go, it's about perception. If me as a parent, I go in and I say like, I don't want my kid to wear a mask and I don't want it. And I'm like, then you're already transmitting that. So you're already letting your anger into other people. You're taking that anger out. Just better to do like that check-in within your own emotions and say, okay, but if it is a mandatory thing and I can't find a system right now, let's just transmit a message of like, all right, we have to go out, but we have to wear the mask. And then it's a little bit different. And then trying to figure out if you can talk to someone about the anger that is giving you so that you don't interrupt those relationships that you can still have, but you have to acknowledge that your anger, figure out a way that you can communicate that anger healthily, and then you process it in your own way so that you don't put it into others because it's not fair. It's not their fault. We just have different beliefs. In general, we know that anger is more destructive and dysfunctional, uh, and, and it just needs to be controlled. So for example, we know the research on mass compliance, you can get angry at these people and yell at them, and we know that that is counterproductive. That, that's clearly established. It doesn't change behavior. So we, we have to get beyond anger. My first reaction in seeing people who are just uh, going about their daily business without masks is anger. Uh, I do come from Brooklyn. My wife characterizes me as a Brooklyn thug. That's okay. So my first reaction can be anger, but I have to control the reaction to give them a lecture about it because it's not going to change their behavior and, and results in other problematic uh, uh, responses. Mm -hmm. it just I, oh, <laughs> I was just gonna say, we have to just worry about what we can control. Mm -hmm. And if we can control our own sphere, our own silo, about what we are comfortable with, I think that's that's more important than trying to get other people to acclimate to what we think is right. Yeah. Um, and and I think that that is that is very hard for us. Um, but I think that's also a way for us to um, develop more positive connections with others is when we just kind of work on what we can control, like Dr. Jones and Dr. Finkelman are asserting here. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Finkelman, how do you see the media impacting people's mental health? It feels hard to escape the stream of bad news between 24-7 cable news and social media. Is there a point where information has diminishing returns? Uh, the quick answer to that is unfortunately yes. Uh, additional information does have not only diminishing returns, but also dysfunctional returns. So there's a point in which we are in 
information overload and we simply are beyond the ability to process all of the information that is coming at us. And rather than making us more informed and, and more adaptable, uh, it, it's actually making us more anxious. And we know from old psychology courses, the inverted U function of, of stress at a certain point, it, it can uh, be useful in creating some pressure to do things that need to be, do, uh, need to be done. If you go beyond that, and what the media is doing is well beyond that, if you keep putting things out there that just add to our anxiety levels, but aren't creating new solutions, uh, mm -hmm. it becomes destructive to us. It's, it's no longer functional, and uh, it, it is not helping. And yes, we are there now. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to circle back, Dr. Jones, on the question earlier. So uh, when I asked you about what the elderly or senior citizens um, could do and you advised basically how we could help, what about them in particular? If they're at home, if they haven't been able to go out since March, um, they now have more social distance um, restrictions so they can't even meet on their patio. You know, what can senior citizens be doing? They might not be as tech savvy. So what would you advise them to do? Yeah, that one is so hard, especially as you just said, when they're not as tech savvy. I think, um, you know, you actually pointed out the best thing personally and professionally, I think that we could be done is using the phone. Because if they're not as tech savvy, they will still be on the phone. And, um, you know, we, we also need to make sure that seniors are not watching too much news because it's not helpful. That increases the anger. Like it's like getting informed, but like small periods of time during your day, especially for them because they're they're at home all day now. Um, I really do think that creating, if they are able, if they are family members close by, or if they have some kind of community, um, either a senior center or a church or places that are doing these chains, which they are out there, then that will help them to feel a little bit more connected. Engaging on phone calls with your elders, uh, because th th the main thing that you're pointing at is what can they do? And I think it depends on the age. If they're around 70 years old, they can do a lot. But if they're around 90, they're a little bit more limited. If they're limited in mobility, then I think it's the moral responsibility, as Dr. Finkelman talked about it before, of us to reach out to them. So it basically will be, if you know, I will put it in society, to be honest with you. If you know that there are elders in your family or in your inner circle that are completely alone and isolated, please reach out. And if you're an elder listening to this, and if you're able to call and say, you know what, I'm feeling very lonely right now. Who can I talk to? And then figure out like on your list of contacts, start calling them one at a time. You know, and that might give them something more positive to do instead of just staying in isolation. But I do think it's about us reaching out to them a lot. And I, I think for elderly, they need, um, they do need a routine and structure. Um, and we've got to make sure that they're sleeping and eating right. Um, a lot of times they'll skip meals um, with the elderly, they'll just, or sometimes they'll forget that they haven't eaten. I think that's really important to kind of also just check on them in terms of medically and, and psychologically. But I also think it's really important to get our kids involved with the elderly. Mm -hmm. So having them reach out, having them take the phone call. Um, I have my son call my, my, my mother and my in-laws once a day telling him, telling them like, what was your day at school like? What, what did you learn? Even if it's just literally, even if it's like a 20 second conversation, but for them, it really makes them feel connected to him. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're really that interested in being connected to me, but they're very interested in connecting with yeah. their grandkids. So I think that that's really important um, because I do think that gives them a sense of hope and purpose. Mm -hmm. And also they can give advice, they can, they can listen, um, yeah. and they feel a certain meaning when they can obviously shepherd um, children, you know. So yeah. I think yeah. You know, we can send them food. There are so many, um, there are a lot of things. I mean, if we as, you know, the ones that are a little bit more technologically savvy, there are lots of places, lots of links on Instagram and Facebook where you can send seniors these really cute boxes for well-being and that they're not super expensive. You can send them homemade food. You can ship things to them. You can have a people, again, schedules of people that will check in on them to see like if they, ha if they have eaten or what are they doing. What exercises are they doing inside the house that they can do? Mm -hmm. You know, like UNICEF put something huge for like families where you could like do the videos with and they can yeah. all be in Zoom together if they're able and then do the videos together as a family. You could play Kahoot's games with the seniors that they actually can enjoy that eat there a little bit more. 
technologically savvy so they can do all of those things. My colleagues have offered great suggestions that are really meaningful, especially for the, the elderly. They're useful for anyone who's feeling isolated or alone, but even more critical for the elderly. Yeah. Um, one thing that I've done with my my dad, because he lives out of state, is we'll do long distance family uh, movie nights. So we'll watch the same movie at the same time and then call each other afterwards to talk about it. And there's a ton of great, obviously, Christmas movies that you could you know, make that a, a weekly tradition um, now. So uh, that would be my suggestion. Not that I'm a part of the panel, but. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. It's wonderful. Yes, yeah, um, we have to go to the kids. <laughs> Mental health is not discussed seriously in California, both in LA County or the state level. Is there not a point where the lockdowns are making people worse off? The lockdowns are creating uh, severe issues and, and we recognize that. And, and we're now dealing with some uh, very critical trade-offs of physical health versus mental health. And it's, it's terrible that we're in a position that we have to be thinking that way. And these are the arguments that are being used for uh, and against opening schools. And they're valid arguments on both sides. And uh, incoming President Biden has made it clear that one of his agendas in the first 100 days is to get schools open for just that reason. The, the amount of damage that's taking place uh, because of this isolation is significant. Uh, and in many ways, it's very applicable to Los Angeles. The controversy now with banning restaurants from outdoor dining, which many people are saying does not have a, um, a solid empirical rationale for it, and it does further isolate people and further anger and alienate people. So these are very uh, real trade-offs that are taking place. And, and if I could just say something that's been happening globally is that even, even with COVID-19, for example, in Japan, they're having more higher suicide rates as compared to losses due, due to COVID-19. And so when we see that, we can, we can appreciate the, the long-term effects that this is having on people, especially when the CDC is finding, especially for example, for military population, there's been an increase by 20% in suicides. So we know that this is really a long-standing issue in terms of the effect of isolation and social isolation, and also food insufficiency, job insufficiency, financial insufficiency, distance learning. I mean, it's a myriad of, of issues that people, and people are worried also about getting sick. So it's, yeah. I think it's, of course, it's compounded. We do have a lot you know, of indications now of the, the child abuse, how much it has increased. You know, the kids are not going to school. So families where there was an issue before, now it gets so much worse. Uh, domestic violence, mm -hmm. couples arguing so much more here and there. So there is, I think there is a need to continue to talk about mental health, to offer these kind of panels, but starting with, again, like I go, I like to go over, like Dr. Greg was talking before, the control. so start talking within your family, then immediate family, then your friends, and don't be scared of asking, hey, how are you doing? Like, are, do you need any help? Do you want to chat? Do you want to talk? Refer them out? Because I think it starts with us so that we can continue to fight this stigma of mental health, especially now that we're in lockdown again so that people can feel safe talking. Thank you. Um, and there are so many questions coming in. I know we're running out of time and, and every circumstance is different. Someone who's unemployed, someone who's single and trying to figure out how to, to meet someone, couples that are going through divorce. Um, and this question I, I would like to share, it's a tough one, but um, the questioner says, my husband is exhibiting the classic symptoms of depression. I have suffered from depression for over 30 years, so I recognize the symptoms. Since he is reluctant to visit a mental health professional, how can I provide support and comfort during this difficult time? And that'll be our final question. Uh, clearly, if, if uh, there is a question as to how someone not willing to do it, um, my colleagues are in a great position to offer support for a person who recognizes the need and is willing to reach out so one of the early things that can be done is giving advice to a spouse who recognizes that his or her spouse is having this type of uh, problem and is not willing to reach out 
there's still things that can be done that are supportive of the other partner and uh, professional help is critical there as well. This goes back to the old social work level of support that we, we certainly would advocate. But in this instance, it also means that uh, there is advice that can be given to someone else on behalf of an individual who is reluctant to reach out. Yeah, there is, um, NAMI has very um, significant resources of support for the family members that have someone that deals with a mental illness, like depression, anxiety, or some more severe ones as bipolar, schizophrenia, and so on. And they will give you training as a family member as to how to be able to reach out to them and give them some coping skills because it's hard, right? If you're having someone in the house that has depression and they don't want to reach out, then the system around it can do a lot of uh, a meaningful impact for uh, to help them feel a little bit better. So there are a lot of on-drive resources. There is uh, hotlines that you can call to get advice as well. If you have insurance, then please reach out to your insurance and check if they provide any kind of mental health services for you because therapists like us, we can help you uh, find coping uh, uh, new new coping skills that you can transmit to them indirectly, right? It, like, but with the understanding that it's not your job or your responsibility, we just do what we can around them. So I think that would be a, a huge place to start. Thank you so much um, to all of you. Dr. Parekh, I'm going to turn this back over to you. Thank you. So I just wanted to thank Dr. Jones and Dr. Finkelman for their outstanding insights and perceptions on a very important topic. Um, my final remarks are this, is that I just wanted to say that when I think about COVID-19, I think specifically that people are struggling for breath. Um, they're, on, they're being intubated, they're on ventilators. Um, and then we have civil unrest where George Floyd is saying that he can't breathe. So my final remarks, I, I think sometimes the universe is communicating something to us. And um, the most important coping is just taking a time to breathe taking a time to catch your breath, taking a time to be mindful of that moment. And um, I just want to thank you both for your, your terrific <laughs> professionalism and your dedication to your fields. And uh, thank you very much for having us uh, as part of this, this, um, this webinar. We're very, very happy to be here. Thank you very much. Thank we are so thrilled. <laughs> Dr. Finkelman, Dr. Parikh. That was such an outstanding and important discussion, and we so appreciate your time and your expertise. And we, we, we hope we can bring you back in, in the early part of the year to continue with, I know you had so many questions that we couldn't get to, so thank you. Do a so, follow up, just like answering all of those questions. Yeah. <laughs> we will be happy to return. Very Absolutely. much so. Thank you so much. For our viewers, we're in our annual giving campaign that continues through December. Please help us continue to provide superb programs like today's by texting the word GIVE to the number on the screen. We can't do this without your support. We hope to see you tomorrow with politics professor Dan Schnur in Politics in the Time of Coronavirus. And also uh, next week, we have California Congresswoman Karen Bass as part as a keynote for our program. Please go to our website at lawacth.org and register for programs, become a member, make a donation. Everybody, please stay safe, stay informed, and we hope to see you tomorrow. Thanks again, doctors. That was